I'm going to tell you a story. 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 Aurora Wasteland Quarantine by Vaughn Ashby. Episode 3 Beacon of Empathy. Intro from the narrator. The virus became part of our everyday lives. We had to make adjustments. Things we took for granted were lost to us. Being near people you didn't know, whether it was at a movie, a concert, or a sporting event was put on hold indefinitely. People you didn't know no longer looked like people. Instead, they looked like disease carriers. So you did your best to stay away from them. Not that they wanted anything to do with you anyways. You were just as likely to pass it to them as they were to you. The rules of social interaction changed. Six feet away was the new standard, which, if I'm being honest, in certain situations I hope stick around. No one wants to be within six feet of someone dropping a nuclear deuce. It's just unseemly. The space someone left you became a beacon of how serious they were taking the virus. Someone who was reaching over the top of you in the grocery store without a mask on to grab a box of cereal, well, it was likely they weren't too concerned about it. Others would patiently wait and give you your space to do what you needed to do. The beacons of empathy didn't glow bright for everyone. But how's that different from life before the virus? Leaving space between us left space for other things to step in. Filling in the six feet, but most of us didn't see it. I didn't see it. I still don't. For some of us, there is more to see. Those of us unlucky enough, the select few, well, they see the world differently. And space can be both a blessing and a curse. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the beginning. We were all afraid. More so, we were afraid of being afraid. We were all balancing our fears with wanting to live our lives and not wanting to catch the virus. Those days, we didn't know exactly how to manage the virus before we knew how it worked and how we could get around it. I'm not ashamed to say I was afraid. And you're lying to yourself if you weren't either. It's hardwired into us humans to want to survive which is what this story is about. Welcome to the Aurora Wasteland Quarantine. Police report. The population of town drops to zero. Alberta, virus fatality, RCMP. Mountain Edge, Alberta. Mountain Edge RCMP are notifying the population of nearby communities that the town of Mountain Edge has reached 100% fatality rate from the virus. The town's population is at zero. All business and travel within the town is now closed except for the Aurora Wasteland Ghost Tours, to which the RCMP has given a 5-star rating to. Okay, I added the last part. But I mean, come on. You know the tours are going to be good, right? I can't wait to try it, if I ever get out of my house, that is. The story. I took the police report, connected it with the others, and cross-referenced it with the Aurora Wasteland, and well, ran with it. Below is the story I was able to piece together. Being alone is a challenge for the human mind. We are a species designed to live together. When someone is alone for too long, things can go sideways. Normal thoughts and emotions can become skewed, and new baselines for normal can be sent. Being alone can physically alter your brain. Neurons, like thoughts, can be realigned. Jeffrey had lived alone long before the virus. His home was located at the topography line of mountains and prairies. From his front window, he could see a farmer's field, a river, and a town about a two-hour hike away. From his back door, he enjoyed the Rocky Mountains and all their grandeur. His home used to be the center of a town. When he first moved there, the town was doing nothing but growing. But that was 20 years ago. Now, everything was gone. He was the last living human in his town. When the virus hit, Jeffrey didn't know. His world continued on like it always had, except, like people were discovering now, being alone isn't always in your best self-interest. Jeffrey wasn't the same man he was when he first moved to Mountain's Edge. His view of the world had changed. The sun rose over the prairies. It was almost summer, but being so close to the mountains stretched the winter season out. Jeffrey pulled a half-frozen log from the frost-covered ground as his icy breath rolled out of his mouth. He tucked it into his bag, along with the other logs, and continued on. He followed the stone fence and the path he followed every morning. The footsteps and beaten trailhead of his could attest to this. It had been over five years since the last resident of the town had died. Not that Jeffrey had ever talked to them. They both kept their distance, and for Jeffrey, it was for good reason. He was 55 now and getting older. He could feel himself slowing down. 
He'd never been an athlete, but he'd always been physical. He'd used his hands for work all his life. It's partially why he moved out here. He wanted to work in lumber, and he had for over 10 years. But time moves on and technology advances. The company he'd worked for had been sold multiple times over. Eventually, Jeffrey was deemed unneeded and let go. Since then, he'd done nothing. He owned his house and had no expenses except food. Even then, he grew what he could. Jeffrey picked up another log, though it resembled more of a thick branch, and he paused at a predetermined point on the stone fence. He used the stick to examine the loose stone on the top and the pressure plate below it. Everything still looked in place. He examined the wires that ran down from the top of it and the explosive hidden at the base of the fence. It had been years since he'd set them up. One day, he'd stumbled across some explosives in an old logging cabin. He'd used them to set the traps all along the fence around the town. There were nearly 30 of them, and every morning he checked that they were all still there and worked. He was alone. He had to protect himself. As far as he knew, he was the last human alive. God knows there were ample amounts of non-humans out there. From his perspective, it had happened overnight. But when you don't see other humans for months on end, anything that happens with them can seem like it happens fast. After the first encounter with the new hosts on the planet, they'd come looking for him. Which was why he was out checking on the fence explosives. He was getting older, and keeping himself safe was becoming harder. As Jeffrey finished the trip around the fence, he mumbled what he always mumbled. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. It was the numbers from an old TV show he used to watch. The numbers were part of the intro, though he couldn't remember their significance now. But he remembered the show. It was about a family going through their daily struggles, nothing out of the ordinary except the family actually seemed to love each other and acted accordingly. Plus, they ended each episode with the family sitting down to play a board game together. He hadn't watched the show since he was a kid, but it stuck with him. Jeffrey placed the sticks and logs next to the fireplace and took his coat and boots off. After adding a log to the fire, Jeffrey checked his kitchen for food. He was running low. He'd have to make a trip soon to get more. He, something crossed in front of one of the few windows that was open. Jeffrey ran to it and peered out. He'd expected to see one of the creatures that walked the world now. No, he expected to see what he always saw. The woman. Frantically, Jeffrey grabbed his coat and threw his boots back on. He burst through the front door and ran to the window he'd seen her in. He squinted and scanned the property, but saw nothing. She was gone, except at his feet. He saw tracks. Her tracks. He followed them around the house to a tree where a single egg crate sat. He picked it up and peeked inside. A dozen eggs stared back at him. Again, he looked around for her. Again, he saw nothing. She was gone, just like always. He'd been seeing glimpses of her for years. She always seemed to appear at random times and often left him something, but she'd vanished before he could reach her. At first, Jeffrey had thought it was just another person from town, maybe someone who'd moved into one of the other long, vacant houses, but it wasn't. The longer this went on, the longer Jeffrey was sure she wasn't real. Either she was in his head or possibly a ghost, though he wasn't totally sure he believed they existed. Jeffrey retreated back into the house to enjoy the eggs the woman had left for him. As he wiped his mouth from the egg feast he'd enjoyed, he thought more about the woman. How she was always so nice to him. How, if it weren't for her, he likely wouldn't have survived this long. He knew seeing people was likely a bad sign for his sanity. And that had to be what was happening. He had to be seeing her. She couldn't be real. He knew, God help him, he'd know whether he wanted to or not. After he cleaned up his dishes and checked the fire, Jeffrey made himself comfortable in his favorite chair. He eyed his collection of board games that had now spread across three bookshelves. Soon, he needed a fourth. He gathered them on his outings to get food. Each reminded him of a different time he'd taken a risk to venture out close to them, the new hosts. He didn't really have a better name than that, the new hosts of the planet humanity used to call its own. Just as Jeffrey's eyes started to close for a food-fueled nap, an explosion shook his house. He knew the sound. It was one of his explosives. For the third time of the still new day, Jeffrey threw his coat and boots on and sprinted from his house, hunting rifle in hand. The smoke from the explosion along the fence line was already high up into the sky. People from all over would be able to see it. Shit, he hoped that didn't mean more of them would be drawn this way. Before he even reached the fence, which in part had been blown completely down, he heard voices. Their voices. The new hosts. Jeffrey brought his rifle barrel up and pointed it in the direction of the voices. He slowed his pace and scanned back and forth, looking for movement. 
muttering the numbers from the TV show 11235813321. Then he saw it, just like he always did, just like he did with other humans before, and now the new hosts. It was the real reason he had moved out here, and why he had picked a town that was dying. He wanted to be alone, he didn't want to see people anymore. He moved out here to stop being afraid, to get space, to just be with no one else around, because being near people was painful and scary, even if he'd never admit it to anyone, not even himself. Along the fence line he could see what he knew wasn't real. It was out of place and impossible for where it was. A creature larger than Jeffrey had seen before swam around the air, as if it was in the water. Its tentacles were massive. It looked like an octopus, only bigger. Clenched in one of its girthy tentacles was a body, one of the new hosts he assumed. The body was lifeless, as it always was. Jeffrey froze as he watched the tentacle creature continue to swim in circles. It ignored him. Things like that always did. They weren't there for him to interact with, only to bear witness to. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, like the octopus, a man appeared in front of him, along the fence. Jeffrey wasn't sure if it was actually a man or one of the new hosts. While he doubted it was a man, he still didn't know for sure. Either way, it didn't matter. The man was distraught. He was sobbing, snot, tears streaming down his face. There was a gun in his hand. Then it was to his head. Then there was a gunshot, and the man, along with the octopus, was gone. In the distance, Jeffrey could hear people running away and he was alone again. He spent the rest of his morning repairing the fence. The explosion had mostly just scattered the rock that comprised most of the fence. With some mortar that he kept back at the house, Jeffrey rebuilt the fence and reactivated the explosive trigger. After that, he napped. He was getting older. He wasn't exactly sure how old, but he put it at about 50 to 60. He was getting older. Napping was becoming more and more of a priority. A gentle sway awoke him from his slumber. A train line ran not too far away from the town. It was the closest thing to him. After the new hosts claimed the earth, it had taken some time for the trains to come back, but they did. It was a reminder of a better time, which he hated the notion of an old guy sitting in his cabin wishing for the good old days to come back, but he did feel that way. Life was simpler when he was younger. He thought of the TV show he loved and the games they played. He wished he could have a life like that, but he didn't. He was alone, a blessing and a curse. The next morning, Jeffrey got up and did his normal walk. The fence repairs had held overnight. Then he enjoyed the last of the eggs and took stock of his food supply. He was low, extremely low. He needed to get food. After throwing another log on the fireplace, Jeffrey retrieved his old clock radio from his cabinet next to the game shelves. He checked that it still had batteries and turned it on. It took over a minute to fine tune the radio to the channel he wanted. It was from the nearby town, his only location to acquire food. The town had grown since the host took over. The radio channel detailed their news and current events. Listening helped him determine the best time to venture into town. But at the same time, he was certain that if he listened too long, they could find him. The new hosts were smart like that. They could track radio usage. Initially, he was only going to listen for an hour, but something happened. A virus had spread through the town. And from what he could surmise, it had spread much further than that. The longer Jeffrey listened, the more excited he got. A virus was attacking the new hosts at a level he could only dream of. It had to be man-made, and it had to be from other survivors like him. Finally, something had gone his way. Later that night, as the sun vanished behind the mountains, Jeffrey bundled himself in his hunting attire, threw his rifle over his shoulder, and set out to reclaim some food. He hiked past the fence and out into the wilderness and separated his long dead town from the nearby new host occupied town. He always had luck retrieving food from the same locations. The new hosts were no different from the humans who occupied the town before them, wasteful and quick to throw anything out. Jeffrey scavenged food from a few dumpsters. Then he headed towards a grocery store that, for some reason, left boxes of damaged food and other non-perishables out behind the doors in the alley. He wasn't sure why they did that, but their lack of foresight benefited him. As he reached the location where he normally gathered food from the grocery store, he paused at a site he hadn't expected. Normally, everyone in town was asleep by this hour. Meeting someone out at this hour was unexpected, though it did happen. As he reached the grocery store, he found a body laying in the alley. It looked like something had forced its way out of the body. As he examined, he noticed the small spiders crawling all over it. Jeffrey muttered the numbers he always muttered when things got uncomfortable for him. 11235813321. Then, like the giant octopus and the man who had blown his own head off, the body that had been defiled by spiders vanished. Jeffrey shook his head. The visions he saw were getting harder and harder to tell apart from reality. He hated coming to the city. Everyone was so close, and even if they were a brick wall away, he could still see it. With his emotions and fear taking over, Jeffrey turned around to go home. 
He was good like that. He always had been. He knew when to call it quits and when to leave. Now was one of those moments. Staying here would only lead to more bleed between the visions and his reality. Except as he turned to leave, he froze. At first he tried to not look, but it was hard. There were so many of them. Hanging from the buildings above him, there were dozens of bodies. They swayed in the cold wind. He was certain they weren't real. He could have seen them on his way in, but he hadn't, so they had to be visions. Each step down the street produced a new stream of tears down his cheek. There were so many of them. He wondered what could have caused so many people to do this. People? Had he just called the new hosts people? Damn it. He kicked himself for being taken by their looks. They were using the human bodies as suits from the people they'd killed, murdered them, causing a global genocide of the human race. Now their corpses walked the street pretending to be them. And Jeffrey looked up. There were more bodies than he'd remembered. They were killing themselves? Was it the virus? Is it why the town was so quiet? He, something, connected with him from behind, sending him tumbling forward. It was a delivery van. It had clipped him as it passed by. The street was dark and Jeffrey was walking down the center of it, but still. The van driver hopped out. The new host that looked just like a man, that is, hopped out of the van. His hands were in the air and there was a cloth mask covering the lower half of his face. He asked Jeffrey if he was okay. Jeffrey said nothing in return, but got to his feet and dusted himself off. The man repeated the question but didn't come any closer. Jeffrey again said nothing in return. The man looked afraid of him. Jeffrey stepped closer, then saw the same man laying in a hospital bed in the middle of the street next to the van. He was coughing and spitting up blood. The delivery man inched back, then hurried into his van. The hospital bed vanished as the van pulled away, leaving Jeffrey alone in the street. He took a breath and leaned in forward, panting. He hadn't been that close to one of them in a long time. The man looked as scared to be close to Jeffrey as Jeffrey was to be close to him. That was new and he didn't know how to feel about it. He wasn't the one who brought an end to humanity like they had. Why would they be worried about him? Red and blue flashing lights broke his train of thought. Two police cars parked on either side of him, their lights flooding the street. Then they were out of their cars. They had masks on as well. Then their guns were out and they were yelling at Jeffrey to put down the gun. Gun? He'd forgotten about his rifle. He swung it from his shoulder and threw it in the snow. Everything after that was a blur. They rushed towards him, threw him to the ground, and put something around his wrists that were behind his back. Then he was in the back of the police cruiser, driving somewhere. A hospital bed, similar to the one he saw on the street, with the delivery man rushed alongside the car. On the other side was a man hanging himself, similar to the people he'd seen in the street. Jeffrey closed his eyes. This was the end. They would kill him. His body would be used as a host. He'd failed humanity. He'd failed himself. He thought of the TV show, where they played board games, and repeated the numbers. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Over and over he repeated them. Eventually he passed out. It was overwhelming, and Jeffrey wasn't as strong as he liked to believe. The sun cut through the cheap white curtains as it rose the next morning. Jeffrey shielded his eyes and noticed there was something on his face. He touched it with both hands. Was this how they got the host into you? A mask that forced it down your throat? He pulled it free from his face and looked at it. The mask looked just like the ones he'd witnessed the van driver and the police officer wearing. It was simple and fabric. He ran his fingers along it. There didn't seem to be anything sinister about it. He balled it up and was about to throw it from his bed when he noticed he wasn't at home. He was in a white hospital looking room. He recognized it from the TV show. Then a voice politely asked him to put his mask back on. Jeffrey looked around the room. He hoped to see the woman who'd helped him so many times before. Instead, it was another man in bed, similar to the one he was sitting in. The man repeated the request. Jeffrey asked why. The man told him about the virus and how it would pass through the air. The mask was to keep both of them safe. Jeffrey had to laugh at the thought. He wasn't like the man in the bed who... Jeffrey noticed the man in the bed was sitting next to another man who looked just like him in a similar bed. Only the man had a tube coming out of his throat. Jeffrey sighed. They weren't the same and he wasn't going to catch the virus that was affecting them. Days in the hospital turned into weeks. Jeffrey learned that the man in the bed next to him was named Clay. They'd both been born in the same small town and had gone to the same school, but Clay was older than Jeffrey by a few years. The two laughed and they spent hours comparing notes about teachers, the town, and will life. At the time, Jeffrey forgot that Clay wasn't like him, that Clay wasn't even from this world. He was just using the body that was provided to him. Jeffrey wondered if the memories the two shared were real Maybe the hosts were using Clay to extract some information from him. Still, talking to Clay passed the time, but the duplicate version of Clay in the bed with the tube down his throat was becoming more and more unsettling the closer the two men became. At night, as he fell asleep, Jeffrey thought about the TV show. He thought about asking if he could watch it, but he never brought it up. It was too special to him. What if he remembered it wrong? To him, it was perfect the way it was in his head. 
As sleep took him, he mumbled the numbers just like he always did. 1 1 2 3 5 8 13 21. This place was starting to feel more home than his house ever did. One morning, Clay was gone. Because of the virus, there was reduced movement in staff into patients' rooms. No one came to tell Jeffrey what had happened to him. But Jeffrey knew. Just like he knew with anyone else who got close to him. The same reason he stopped getting close to people. Seeing how someone dies while they are standing so close to you can rattle you to your soul. Do it enough times, and your soul will look for an alternate ways to view reality. The morning after Clay died, he was startled awake by a woman sitting in the bed next to him. She had a mask on, like everyone else, but Jeffrey knew who she was. She was the woman who'd helped him before. She was back. Maybe she would help him escape before they could implant the new host in him. The woman said nothing but stared at him. Jeffrey said nothing either, except he could see how she was going to die. The woman wasn't in his head. She was real. She had to be real. Had she been real this whole time? Eventually, the woman spoke. She told him that she thought he was dead. He'd been gone for so long she was sure of it, but that she was happy to have him back. She missed playing games with him and that she wanted him to move back home with her. That living out in that deserted town wasn't good for him. She loved him and missed having her dad around. Dad? Was this woman his daughter? Then he remembered the TV show. Except it wasn't a TV show. It was his memories. He was the dad. She was the daughter. He had a wife. They played games together. All of them. Tears ran down his face which triggered the same from her. They both smiled at each other under their masks. He told her that he was ready to go. She smiled again, but told him that his roommate had just died from the virus. They wouldn't let him leave until he had a negative virus test. Jeffrey laughed. He told her that he couldn't get the virus because, wait, if she was real, and he'd been wrong about her, maybe he'd been wrong about the other stuff too. He asked her how she found him, to which she replied that the staff had called her Jeffrey had been mumbling her phone number to himself every night as he fell asleep. She told him that she'd be back in two weeks to pick him up, but that wasn't to be. Days later, Jeffrey was told he did in fact have the virus. He'd likely got it from Clay, which sent Jeffrey's brain into overdrive. Was he already a host? Was the virus able to cross from new host to human? Were they lying to him? Or was none of the new host stuff real? Maybe he'd been wrong. Jeffrey spent the last week of his life in the hospital. He died from the virus. His daughter later gathered the board games from his home as reminders of their time together. The town of Mountain Edge, where Jeffrey's house still resides, remains deserted to this day. Newspaper headlines. Alberta town of Mountain's Edge, final resident taken by the virus. Edmonton Ebok. Mental health cases and Aurora Wasteland cases increase at the same rate. Brightness Falls Gateway. Scientists discover that time is uniquely experienced by everyone. E. Calgary Science Digest town of Mountain Edge discovered to hold unique collection of Aurora Wasteland artifacts. Wasteland Explorer Newsletter. Explosives safely removed from Mountain Edge by Canadian military. Lethbridge, Dark Times. Conclusion from the narrator. That's it. Who knew that being afraid of being near people could be both a blessing and a curse? Jeffrey's mind was forced to deal with how those around him were going to pass on. It did what humans do. It adapted to survive, which led him to be alone and being afraid of being near others. It forced him and his reality of the world to change. Like Jeffrey, people's views of the world can easily be altered by what their mind allows them to see. Everyone was forced to spend time alone and apart from others during the virus. While Jeffrey was an extreme, life, for some people, wasn't that far off. Hey, my name is Von Ashby. I wrote this. If you liked what you heard, head on over to vonashby.com slash free and pick up a free novel or a bunch of other free stuff. Go explore the Aurora Wasteland yourself at aurorawasteland.com. Don't forget to check out the Stories from the Wasteland podcast and search for Von Ashby on YouTube for video versions and other exciting videos. Thanks for listening. <laughs>